There we go. Hey, this is great. After several months, I feel like we got the band back together again. Bill Gustin, Miami Dade, Clark Lamping, Clark County Fire, Dan Shaw, Fairfax, Captain Mike, winner of this year's Tom Brennan Lifetime Achievement Award. You should have won it several years before. And man, I can't think of anybody more qualified or deserving. Mike, God bless you and congratulations. Uh, our newly uh, appointed uh, captain in the training division of the Oakland Fire Department, Daryl Liggins. Uh, welcome to the club, Daryl. Welcome to the club. Uh, and, and believe me, you will affect more change on your department being in that training division than you ever did in the field. It's just, that's just the way it works. And if, uh, if it's anything like what I've experienced, you're going to be tasked with some really interesting things. So, uh, I'm really happy to have you all back, uh, after, uh, the summer. I don't know the next time we meet captain Mike, I don't have a calendar in front of us. Um, so I don't know if uh, se September 11th is going to come and go before we uh, have our next meeting. Uh, Mike, would you have a, a calendar there? You could take a look and see. It's going to be September 8th, Cap. September okay. 8th is going to be. All right. Well, then we're going to talk about September 11th. That'll be 20 years ago. And um, I talked to a, a, a group of uh, fire recruits uh, yesterday and through no fault of their own, you know, they don't, they weren't born. Well, yeah. Bill, I got to tell you, I will not be here on September 8th. I am having the honor and the privilege of addressing the military firefighter recruits from all five branches of the service, Coast Guard, Army, Navy, Marines, and Air Corps. And I am going to be addressing their 300, I think it's 300 cadets uh, in San Angelo, Texas. And I am also going to be later having lunch with all of their career officers for that. So uh, that is uh, going to be the highlight of my uh, September 11th uh, ceremonies, because I can't think of a better way to pay it forward than to address these young men and women who are starting in the fire service. And a lot of them were not even born on September 11th. Oh, Mike, then, congratulations, man. And, you know, we're all proud of you. And, and uh, you represent uh, fire engineering, FDIC, and you represent us, you know, our group, of, our, uh, our band of thieves here. And uh, my gosh, that is a wonderful uh, opportunity. And, and of course, you're very qualified and deserving of that. Um, I hope, will, will it be archived, Mike? I do not know that bill i will find out when i talk to them but uh if it is i will let you know and uh i can't wait to talk to these uh people who are just starting they're you know they're kids they're just starting their career in the fire service and sure. i'm looking fo so forward to this sure uh we're gonna be talking about hoes today we're kind of getting back to the basics and uh because i got a wild hair I'm not going to say where it is, but I got a wild hair. I've got a uh, something I feel very passionate about, and uh, not to air my department's dirty laundry in public, but we're pretty much a transparent department, and we're always striving to uh, evaluate new things and reevaluate uh, things that we've been doing for years. So uh, we have been using a certain hose load since 1979. And it's time for us to take a look because uh, things have changed since we introduced that, that hose load. And I'll, I'll get into more uh, detail here momentarily. And then we're going to look at some pictures to get us in the right uh, frame of mind. But as long as we're talking about hose, we might as well talk about key hose because that's my favorite. And it's my favorite because they're dragging it around out there on that asphalt that probably is 110 degrees right now uh, out on that drill ground. Um, and it's, um, I, I say it every month, take the key challenge. I don't care what, uh, grade you buy of key hose, uh, try to kink it, try to kink it. Uh, just the other day I had my hands on the uh, combat sniper, 
which is a little smaller diameter version of the combat ready. It has the same remarkable uh, kink resistance uh, through the weave design. In other words, the liner and the fabric of the first jacket are extruded together and the outer jacket is simply there for abrasion and heat resistance. Uh, your combat sniper is, uh, as my, my friend Mark Lighthill likes to say, who um, is their, their sales manager and one of their researchers is, because uh, they're always looking for new, new things and they're very responsive. Um, it's happy, happy gallons per minute. It's, it's happy space is 160 gallons a minute. It's 160 gallons a minute, whereas the uh, combat ready would be uh, more in the neighborhood of the 185 gallons a minute. So, um, Peter, thank you so much. I hit you with so many things. And um, if you could uh, bring up the first picture. And I think we'll have a uh, Mike, you'll 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 get a kick up kick out of this and then i've got stand by bill I'm, I'm finding them for you so. that's that's all right that's all right and my department has been using the triple layer also called the s load since 1979 there we go and there's your s load showing uh one of its um its biggest drawbacks is that uh, you are dragging the entire line and you are dragging it in three layers. Now, the idea behind it and under ideal conditions, it works great because what you're doing is you're stacking three layers of your stretch that's pre-connected, uh, say 200 feet, and uh, you're loading it in three layers. So when you pull the line with the nozzle with the loop uh, in roughly 70 feet, one third of the overall length of the stretch, you've got it out of the cross lay bed. So in a suburban setting where an apparatus with a cross lay can pull up in front of a private dwelling, a, a house, that has a it's set back, let's say 75 feet, suburbia. And, uh, and you can pull it at direct right angles and go to the front door, it works fine. But that's not Miami-Dade County of 2021. Uh, Miami-Dade County of 2021 is highly, highly urbanized. Uh, a, significant number of single family homes have been renovated either eagle, legally or illegally to house one or more families. So the opportunities of us reaching a fire coming through the front door is significantly less than it was in 1979. And we've got, we're stretching hose, dragging hose, dragging hose around a multitude of obstacles. Now, um, this is a staged picture, okay? Uh, however, that gentleman that is going to be introduced to the criminal justice system that's in the back of that car, that was not staged. But um, this is the problem with this, is that we're dragging our hose and it is just being attracted to what I call hose magnets. Can I go to the next picture? Because I want Mike to weigh in on this one. Mike, um, this is obviously an FDNY engine. Engine 15. And, and Mike, uh, arguably, arguably, no one stretches hose around corners, around obstacles, upstairs, return stairways, wrap around stairways, wrapped around an elevator, better than the FDNY. Now, they have the hose load, they have the people, and they have the training. Uh, but that's not suburbia. Uh, you're looking at apparatus that's got uh, 750 gallons. Uh, yeah, you can get an L-shaped water tank, but it's it, that hose, right, that rig right there, you guys have not lost sight of the purpose of a fire department 
pumper, which is to carry, deploy, and pump hose. The reality is in today's fire service, you are a multi-service, multi-hazard uh, business. So we've got a ton of extrication tools. Now we've got decontamination tools uh, in these compartments. Um, hazardous material mitigation tools, five gallon containers of foam. I mean, we are packed up. Uh, we have our, our hose extension packs and our standpipe, uh, two inch standpipe packs as well. So we're, we're packed up. But uh, Mike, uh, the tire rim, is that something that is, and, and you, you know where it goes, it would go, it goes right in front of the hose magnet. It would go right in front of that, that the tire of that police car. Absolutely. The nickname of that piece of apparatus is called the fifth man. The fifth man. I like it. Okay. Because a I lot like of our engines only have four firefighters. So they only have three doing the stretch. So Mike, what you do by having that, you have eliminated that guy that's going to have to be the conveyor right there uh, well, between the apparatus and the first obstacle. Hopefully, Bill, but the problem with it, like everything else, is the hose has to stay where you put it. It can't get snagged and get pulled up or caught or anything else. It's a great tool, but it's not the end all be all that a firefighter with his eyes looking at it, he or she could be down there looking at it and seeing any other snags that come into place. But it does help us get around those, around those tires on those cars when we are stretching. And we in New York, just like Miami-Dade, have all of the cars, have all of the double parked cars, have the apparatus being blocked out and everything else. So a lot of our companies have these things and they use them and they use them very, very well to help them stretch around these things. And you know, you, you spent most of your time on ladder companies and uh, you know, our, our, our men are, uh, your, the namesake of your award uh, is uh, Tom Brennan. Yep. Uh, a ladder company guy. Yep. I think a 111, right, Mike? 111, right down the ball. Yeah. From us. Okay. And as ardent a truck firefighter as he was, I know there were a few things that angered him more than a ladder company person walking past a kink in a hose line. And man, that would piss him off. It should piss everybody off, Bill. It should piss everybody off. The hose is not covered with dog feces. The hose is not electric. You can bend down and pick it up. Water is what puts the fire out. Kevin Shea, who I love, and we all know, his father was the captain of 82 engine back in the heyday. And I never forget when Kevin's father told me one time we met and he said, you know what the truck is without the engine? I said, no, sir, what is it? He said, six more victims. You got it, brother. You and got it. he's, a, you know, listen, we need to help the engine find the fire in some of those big buildings. We don't want to be stretching up the wrong wing of the building, which I have been, you know, we get, oh, it's up here. It's up here. We get up there as the truck. And the guy says, yeah, I got smoke in my apartment. We're looking around. We go to the window, look outside. It's the adjoining apartment on the back wing of the building. So we're, we have to go back downstairs, six floors down back up six floors up to get to it and um that's the way it's supposed to work that time it didn't quite work that way we kind of did something um that wasn't uh we went over the roof and back down but that's not recommended that's not recommended but the thing with this is is again the truck and the engine have to work together and there is nothing wrong with bending down and helping your brothers and sisters get that hose into place because that's what's going to put the fire out. That's what's going to eliminate our problems. And we need that hose line. Uh, uh, Pete, can you show the next picture? Okay. This is not what we want. As the nozzle firefighter, you are responsible for 50 feet at least 50 feet. If we're going to a private dwelling, at least 50 feet. We want that hose laid out in line with the sidewalk. 
uh, preferably bring your coupling or couplings up onto a porch if there is one so that the couplings don't hang up on the stair treads. Um, I want to give a shout out to uh, Steve Robertson uh, from Columbus, Ohio. Uh, fantastic job, Steve. Uh, he teaches with such a passion. Uh, his class was at FDIC was stretching for success. Uh, if you ever have a chance to attend one of Steve's classes, uh, either hands-on or in the classroom, uh, he gets it. He gets it, and his class is applicable to, to any size fire department. So what we got here is we're doing the pulling pile, and we're taking the nozzle and running with it, and that's not what we want. So can we go to the next picture there, Peter? All right, so with the, with the triple layer, this is basically what we're forced to do, Daryl is that we have to improvise some type of load, in this case, a reverse horseshoe, by walking back on the line and gathering up sections in order for us to be able to carry something that goes around corners. Next picture, Pete. Look at that crazy old man snuck out of the nursing home and he's pretending to be a fireman. And, uh, but there he is. And uh, we're picking up the whole, and next. All right, so now we're gonna go through this fence gate, but look at the obstacles. And then not, and not to mention with the, the, the double park cars. So, uh, and then all the crap in the front yard, uh, the junk cars. Uh, you know, this is not uh, Beverly Hills, okay? You've got uh, junk cars, you've got uh, junk lawnmowers. There's a multitude of obstacles, um, a minefield of obstacles. In the next picture. All right, this, this to me, I took this picture several years ago. This is Broward Sheriff Fire Rescue. This is a simple, Flat load, but look at, and that is not a tall firefighter right there. Not a tall firefighter. In fact, intentionally, they picked the shortest guy. Now, what this guy does, because this cross lay is at a sensible height, he can pull the load, part of the load or all the load, out halfway and then twist it. I think the next picture will show you how he twists it so that it plays out like a Minuteman load so that the nozzle is closer to uh, the body. And I think that might be the last picture there. We got any more? Yeah, and you could go through a multitude. Now, I'm up for suggestions. Let's, uh, let's open this thing up. Uh, Clark, you're in a highly urban area, the Metro Las Vegas area. Uh, I visited your firehouses, but I do not remember your, your hose load configuration. How does your department configure and deploy hose when you have a multitude of obstacles, such as stairs and fences and vehicle tires, Clark? Cam yeah, Gustin, we have all of our cross lays are loaded the same flat lay. Uh, we have two inch and three quarter, 200 foot uh, fog nozzles. And then we have a two and a half inch, 200 foot fog nozzle as well. And they're flat loaded with two loops. Uh, we have the same, it is a very, very old load. And we have the same challenges that you have. We have discussed, and that's the majority of what comes off is the cross lay. The back, we have two 500 foot sections of uh, just uh, static line. And then we have thousand feet of five inch supply. Uh, and then we have a couple bundles. We have the Cleveland load, which I know you're a huge fan of. Um, and we have a couple uh, loads like that. Uh, what we found works for us. Um, and again, our, our, we have an engine manufacturer that we told the engine manufacturer that we need a shorter wheelbase because our guys are tearing. It's, we have too compact in our first in. So we wanted a shorter wheelbase, but we said, we don't want to give up any cabinet space. So what do they do? Now our, our engines are so tall now that you have to step up on a step to even access the, the cross lays. So what we figured out works best for us right now is two firefighters deploy the hose simultaneously 
each grabs a section and they pull it out and they can pull it parallel to the engine in either direction, get the hose out, and then they walk together and walk towards the objective. Uh, we call that the close quarters maneuver. And we do that when we've got a fence right there. Yep. Or we do that in a trailer park. In other words, you can't pull it at right angles to the apparatus. So you got to get it out of the, the bed. Now, Correct. do you have loops in your hose load to facilitate that, um, that pulling? And can you pull it from either side of where the nozzle is sitting? Yes, sir. Yes, there's a loop uh, on the first and the third section of hose. First and third section have a loop. And, and there's loops on both sides, so it could come off either side of the apparatus. And can you gather the hose and put it on your forearm or on your shoulder if you're going around a lot of obstacles? If you are about seven feet tall, you can. Okay. But really, the, the hose load, it is the, ho the top of the hose load might be over eight feet in the air. Uh, we just had somebody uh, weigh in on a, a load that they suggested. And uh, I'm going to look at that during the archive version, but I encourage folks to, uh, to weigh in on this. Good thing about this thing is we're going into this with an open mind. My objective is take a look at the triple layer and, and then determine, is that good? And if it's not good, then we'll start looking at alternatives. I don't want to start with a preconceived notion, try to sell any kind of hose load. So we're, we're experimenting. And that's one good thing about Miami Day. So uh, Chief Dan, I know it's been a long time since you've, because uh, you've got so many damn meatballs on your badge. I don't know how you have so many bugles on your badge. Do you like alternate days? Uh, so you don't get scoliosis because you've got such a heavy badge. What what rank are you now? On no, I, I give them to my aide. He carries them. Okay, he carries <laughs> your badges around. All right, good. Uh, no, not not that many, man. Not that many at all. Uh, all I, I'm right. just a de just a deputy chief. All right, can you can you? I'm, I'm gonna same question. Same yeah. Question, chief. No, we, we spent a lot of time on this. Um, and to your point, uh, is, is really working towards making sure we have the, the best hose load uh, for the mission uh, and taking away the personalities and the egos of it. Uh, and I will preface it too. I mean, again, if, I, if we had the staffing and we have four in every engine, if we had the staffing that Mike had in his department, um, I think we could go away because I think uh, cross lays have become the dumbification of the fire service You're because they took straight. away they took away the thinking process right because Mike's control man has to estimate the stretch and figure it out whereas is your one of your pictures showed the house is 50 feet away and we pull 400 feet of hose because that's the hose load we have but to that point um, our engines are set up very very similar uh, we have a hose uh, donut roll in the front bumper uh, that's used for any any means they want to typically it's used for a lot of either really close to the house or um, for dumpster fires car fires things of that nature uh, we have two cross lays. we use uh, Minuteman and look I, I'm an advocate for it for my 26 you know plus years in Fairfax it's all we ever had I've never understood the the, the load that you're going away from uh, I came from a system that we had the flat load, so I don't understand why you'd want to use a load which you have to flip it to make it look like a Miniman. Just use a Miniman. Um, okay. So we just, All right. we, we love the Miniman. Um, it, it really works out well for us. Uh, that's 200 and 250, but we also give leeway to the captains to make sure that, that those, it's a minimum of 200, but make it match your first due and your building stock. So if you, if you need a 200 and 300, go with it. If you need 200, 200, go with it. Uh, and then on the rear of the engine, uh, we do not do any lines with Gator Wise. So we don't, do, we used to do the apartment pack, uh, the leader line, the two and a half for the Gator Y with another 200 feet inch three quarter. Uh, and thankfully, you know, we evolved to understand that that in theory sounds great, but in practice, it's just not a good idea. So we run a 400 foot inch three quarter hose line off the back. Uh, that is a Three, it's a minute man load essentially, but it's a three, three person load. So shoulder drag and two shoulder loads in a drag uh, and three guys take that and they're gone. Uh, works out really well, or two can take it if they need to. Um, and then, you know, this, we, we do four inch supply line and three inch supply line. And then every engine has hose bundles for high rise, inch three quarter and two and a half. And then our nozzles are all the same. Uh, years ago we did this and I was very, again, very, very fortunate where I work. We're hiring by the way. Uh, very fortunate where I work that they were 
and completely supportive of doing a nozzle project where we saw that we had, you know, these larger departments, a lot of times you end up with civilians just ordering from a catalog to replace your nozzles. And we found that we had 10 different types of Akron nozzles on our engines, which was problematic because you looked at the numbers and, you know, this order some. Um, so essentially we designed our own nozzle with uh, Akron, which is a uh, 15 16 tip with a breakaway fixed gallonage, 175 gallonage fog nozzle on the end. So it gives you the option of, again, we give the options to the captains. If you're going to run with the 15 16 that's fine. Uh, if you're going to run with 175 uh, GPM, that's fine also. And then all our nozzles are 50 PSI, just to streamline, so everything's 50 PSI. And is it a integral smooth bore? Yeah. Integral smooth bore. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you got a 175, close enough, 10 gallons a minute. Yeah. So 175 to 185. Yeah, if you want to make right. the change, you go right. to it, you can. Okay. Uh, I got I mean, to relate this to you. It's, it's somebody that uh, we both admire and look up to very much. Uh, I, at my workshop, I look in the back of the class and I see uh, Chief Larry Schultz. Uh, he's the man. And he is the man, but you know, I, I, I said, oh my God, now I'm going to get nervous. I, said, <laughs> <laughs> I went back there and I said, Chief, thanks for coming, but you intimidate the crap out of me. I said, Chief, you know how I feel right now, Chief? You know how you make me feel? You make me feel like Kim Kardashian's fifth husband on our wedding night. In other words, I know what to do, but I'm not sure I can make it interesting for you. But God bless that guy. You know, uh, always a student of the trade, man. Always a student. He sets a good example. Yep. And um, from D.C., I understand he cut his teeth on D.C. Engine 10. And um, another dear friend that I've, I've, uh, I've acquired over the years is Dave Hibben, uh, who was also a, an Engine 10 guy. Uh, you know, my dad told me years ago, Bill, you're going to find out that some of the firefight best firefighters on some of your busiest companies tend to be a little odd. Well, you know, look at, look at me. You don't get any weirder than I am, but you know, you get a guy that stays any length of time at a, at a company like engine 10 that runs 10,000 runs a year, man, you know, after a while you're talking to yourself, but both of those guys did it, Dave Hibben and, uh, um, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, and Larry Schultz. So Larry, and, if you're watching, man, uh, that meant the world to me. And so, Larry's still doing it, man. Yeah. I mean, again, he's in a great role right now, leading an organization and doing great stuff. Captain Mike, when you load your hose bed, you do something a little different. I call it the typewriter. If you remember what a typewriter is, because when you get to the end of the, the line, you go back, you cross back over. Can, can you explain that? Uh, that's the difference. And if you'd like, I could bring the, the picture back up, but that, that's up to you. Uh, you don't have to bring the picture back up, Bill. We cross it over at the back to make it easier to come off in the front and it just works for us and it's worked so well for us for so many years that we like to do it and i know it's tradition and everything else and i just think that um the engine companies they load what works for them in their response areas and it depends on if you're in a private dwelling area in queens you know you're looking for speed and mobility to get in there if you're looking for a tenement area where you need to go up a bunch of stairs, then maybe you're going to load a different load, a different number of um, lengths of inch and three quarter versus the uh, filled out with two and a half. And again, it's going to be a uh, difference. We don't have the only pre-connects we have are, are our trash lines. In the oh, front Mike, bottom. Mike. So your companies, I'm gonna, I'm gonna guess it's the captain of the company has the latitude to um, tailor, tailor his hose load for his response area? Yes, yes. Okay, now I, I'm i gonna get a pushback because of standardization. However, uh, Daryl, I already sent you the, the, the memo I wrote. Uh, we have two criterias for whatever hose load if we do uh, choose to replace the triple layer. Number one, it's got to be foolproof. That means fireman proof. Okay. 
That means anybody can pull it. You can't screw it up. And number two, it has to be forgiving. It can't be so precise when you load it. You know, loading a triple layer load, you're loading three layers. The hose all has to be connected at one time. And you, we have to use our roller that we use for our large diameter hose and roll it and roll the air out and go back and roll it again and roll it again and then try to pack that in. It's not. And the ergonomics of a new apparatus, um, and I wonder how many fire departments actually do this. Uh, they go to the, uh, during the design phase. Do we ever consider where people are going to stand how they're going to reach when they're loading, say, a, a cross leg. Do, do we ever really consider that? And, and I would say for the most part, my department included, no, we don't. Uh, when in fact, one of these days, somebody's going to take a header off of a modern fire apparatus, which is about 11 feet in the air, and they're going to get their feelings hurt. Uh, and that's another factor. Go ahead, Mike. When um, I was in the FDNY, I was on the apparatus committee for the trucks and we were going down to look at some rigs at that time. And we were going for three days, two nights. And I showed up with a suitcase and a guy looked at me who was in charge from um, the fiscal side of government. He was in charge from uh, the, you know, DCAS. Um, and he said, you know, we're going for two nights. I said, I know. And he said, you know, we got to pay for that. I said, I know. He goes, what do, you, what do you think we're doing? You're going out to dinner? I said, no, that's my bunker gear. I said, I'm not going on to a rig without my bunker gear. I said, it's my boots, my gear. When we get down there, I want an air pack. I said, I don't have my helmet, but I don't really need my helmet, but I'm going to sit in that rig and climb on that rig in full gear. And anyone who's on an apparatus committee for an engine or a truck who's not bringing someone they're outliers. They're tallest guy. Is he going to hit his shins? They're shortest guy. Is he or she going to have a tough time jumping up? They're heaviest guy, whatever it is. If you're not bringing people down there to sit in the seats in their bunker gear and to participate in this and see how that hose is going to come off that rig, then you're not doing yourself in the job of service. Then you get it up there and you have a problem. We can't, we need a, a step stool to get on the back step OK, and I know places who put drop down steps because they have problems getting up on the on the rig off the street, especially during the winter when it's slippery and everything else. This is part of what our job is, our people who are going down there. And that's why we as firefighters and fire officers have to get involved in our rigs, in our apparatus committees, in everything else to see how we are going to make this work for our department. I don't think any one of us, our departments, have the same exact setups on our rigs, but we find out what works. Daryl might see what works in New York City and say, wow, we're going to try that, okay? Dan might say, well, in this area, we're going to all private dwellings. We ain't going to do that. That's never going to work for us. And then Clark's going, I'm going to a high-rise hotel. I need something totally different. But you have to look at this. And if you're not spending time doing that and you're not involved in it, then you really don't have, if you don't have a seat at the table, you shouldn't be complaining. If you don't actively try to get there. Hey, Bill, can I add one thing to your point also? And I think, it, I think we are going to that trend. Um, and I know for my, my year I spent in support services, which you know, that includes apparatus, uh, we dropped the host beds considerably. Uh, and that's pushing the manufacturer to, to kind of redesign what they're doing with the, the tank in the back of the engine to be able to re, you know, reconfigure that to make sure that we're, one, we're not making the things so top heavy, it's going to flip over, but two, but also to meet the ergonomics of the, the, the workforce that we hire. And you look at our mutual friend, what Ricky's doing over in PG. I mean, some of those engines he's designing every single day, I mean, they're beautiful. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're set up for that exact reason. So I think in a lot of, I, I see a lot in our, in the Nova region where I am, that a lot of us are mirroring a lot of what our rigs look like of dropping the rear hose beds, trying to bring the cross lays down a little bit lower uh, and making it so it's a quick deployment of those hose lines. But Mike's exactly right. I mean, it comes from getting good intel from the people who are doing it every day and then pushing the manufacturers to start to redesign the apparatus to what you want. Because um, it's, it's convenient for them just to push out a, a rig 
that they do all the time and that's a standard template versus hey i, I need these added extra things i mean I, my eyes were open when i went to our manufacturers and walked around with our apparatus guys and hey why do we have uh not a flat roof uh a flat roof on our engines but we have the raised roof in the back yeah stand up on time oh okay so getting out of the rig with your scba and your six one you know, that extra couple inches of space is huge when I'm trying to get out of the rig with my SCBA and not hit it on the door on my way out. So I think I think we're seeing that trend. I mean, I know just in the, the Nova region, uh, including uh, our Maryland partners in D.C., you know, they're, they're working together, which is a fantastic thing. And they're putting all those apparatus guys who do all that design from Maryland, Virginia, uh, D.C., all together meeting once a month to talk about what they're specking. And, and brainstorming those ideas to make that collective group. So I think we are seeing that change in that trend. And you're, for, for our viewers, uh, you're referring to Ricky Riley. Uh, he, uh, he, he specs the apparatus for... Um, PG, Prince PG, George's yeah, County. Prince George's County. Um, anything that he writes, I think he writes for Fire Apparatus and Equipment Journal. Uh, he, he gets it. He gets it. And, uh, and I get it. Uh, when I was referring to Dave Hibben, who's an engine 10 guy, uh, he brings, now he works for Keyhole. Um, and you don't get a more experienced firefighter uh, than the, the, the fellas that work for, for Key. The vast majority of them are, are not only uh, uh, retired guys, but retired heads hands-on guys with years and years of firefighting experience. So they've had their hands on the hose quite a bit. Um, I'm going to ask Daryl, but before I start, I want to, I want to talk about our mutual friend because um, it, it is um, Dennis Laguerre. Uh, he made a comment in, uh, I think it was on Facebook about how Miami Dade has uh, chosen to put the relocate uh, with our new apparatus to put the breathing apparatus back in the uh, in the cab, uh, and he did it with class. He did it with class. It actually was a compliment for our department because basically what he said was, "We're the sixth biggest fire department in the United States. We tried something. It didn't work as we planned." So we admitted it didn't work as planned and we corrected it. So we left the egos out. And I just think the way that uh, he worded it was uh, just, it shows what a class act that uh, this Dennis Laguerre is. If you're watching Dennis, God bless you, brother. Uh, and I hope your feet feel better. Uh, Daryl, I'm going to hit you up with the same questions. Uh, oh, and by the way, the, uh, I'll hit you up with the same questions, but uh, my point is with key is that you're talking to people that have great credibility when you're de dealing with a representative from key, at least for the manufacturer. So Daryl, I'm going to, I'm going to let you take the stage here for a while. And um, I'm really interested what, uh, what you have to say. I know you're an engine guy at heart and i um, Okay, if I can just tell a story. You know, when you get old, you start to tell a lot of stories. So I go to teach a, a class in Modesto, California. Why the hell they would have me, I don't know. So, and then Bobby Halton, and I saw you there teaching, but I didn't, and I went to your class, but I didn't know who you were. Uh, I just knew that you were this, this hap, ha, uh, very handsome looking, ruggedly handsome, dark skinned guy. Uh, probably lost your call. You should have been a movie star or something like that, <laughs> or at least a Calvin Klein underwear model. Maybe that would have been a good thing. But so I watched this guy, the way he handles the hose and the way he, he talks. And then uh, it wasn't long after that that Bobby Halton asked me to uh, uh, assemble a group of a diverse group uh, from around the country. And I said, I got just the guy on the West Coast. But I didn't know who you were. So I went back to the guy on Modesto and I showed a picture. I said, who is this guy? And that's how I got your contact information. What do we got here? More comments. Randy Wong. It's what? Uh, listen, I'll, I'll look at these uh, archive versions and uh, I'll have some answers for, for because or you got to keep the hashtag up there longer because. All right. 
No problem, Cap. Oh. Okay. All right, go ahead, Daryl. If this is uh, – I can't see which Randy Wong it is, but uh, if it's the Randy Wong, I think it is. Uh, he works in Gilroy, assistant uh, chief. How are you doing, Randy? He did a paramedic. Oh, okay. Different Randy Wong. I didn't think there was away. only one. So uh, let me shut my phone up here. I don't know if it's the coffee I've been having or this topic, but I just get tingles when we start talking about hose loads and efficiency. There's, there's so much to talk about. And um, I'm fortunate that I have experience with a lot of, you know, variety from the triple load gated wise, the pre-connects flat loads and minute mans and all that. And, you know, just in full disclosure, I think that FDNY load is misunderstood by so many people thinking that it takes a lot of people and it's only for a large urban city going up tenements. It's one of the most versatile hose loads, the simplest hose load, I think, on the face of the planet. It takes less people and works in a lot of uh, areas. And we modeled our static load here in Oakland, which then Portland followed and modeled their static load after that load. And it's tremendously versatile. Um, if people think New York City is just a bunch of high rises, and, and Mike can attest to this, there's plenty of areas that that look like uh, the the town I'm in with just a lot of private private dwellings. And uh, it's when you look at departments with a lot of variety that do a lot of fire duty, whether it's Los Angeles City or Detroit or New York, when you get engine companies that do not uh, try to have a variety show, you know, from district to district, which that's usually tied to pre-connects that this district wants this length pre-connect and this district wants this length. It's, it's remarkable that you could go from a high rise district to a brownstone district to a area up in the Hollywood Hills to a place with a lot of uh, seemingly uh, suburban houses and have a department that has the same load because it's a very simple static load. And I think the simplicity almost scares people, but it works very well. Now here's, here's part of the issue. I think earlier we talked about, uh, you know, staffing. Sure. Some of these departments have higher staffing, but regardless what your staffing is, you have to get the hose from point A to point B. And a lot of the other types of loads, whether you're extending a line or doing a gated Y operation is more manpower or intensive. You're carrying heavier hose and making more connections and things like that. So I think that is a, is a, is a big myth. When it comes to making uh, changes and evaluating different systems, um, I, I would implore you all to look at something called status quo bias. And just as humans, we, uh, one of our flaws as humans is we find something that seemingly works. You know, you, you hunted the animal, you use this weapon, you got food, so it's deeply ingrained, and there's a huge resistance to change. <laughs> or you may not be eating if you try a different method. <laughs> so whether uh, whatever your situation is, we are so comfortable with that situation and comfortable that it, it worked that we're just going to stick with it. So that's called status quo bias. And I think we're all guilty of it. And it's what causes people to stay in bad relationships or scared to sell their house or resistant to change a job or get a new car or even get a new pair of shoes, for God's sakes. They're, you're, you're comfortable where you are and we tend to stay there uh, in, in our comfort zone. And when we say things like we have an open mind, um, uh, sometimes we're not as open as, as we think. And so anyway, being part of a lot of different changes in my organization, what I have found is it, it's not about the equipment. It's not necessarily convincing people that a smoothbore nozzle is good or a static load is good. Uh, it's it's not about the equipment. We know it works. We have UL studies. We have places with experience. We have things that can 
uh, show. It's that human nature that we're trying to change to say it's okay to try something different. Because when you take away something people are comfortable with, there's literally a, a sense of loss. It's something you went to the academy with. It's something you have experience with. It's things you uh, got little tricks of the trade with along the way. You taught other people. And now you're going to take that away and, and give me something different. There's literally almost like a, a grieving process uh, in, in, that, in that change. But um, there's a couple of quotes I wanted to uh, talk about. Um, one is from Albert Einstein. He said, everything should be made as simple as possible, but no simpler. And when I look at that static load on the back of that FDNY engine, it, it is very simple. It really can't get as much simple. It, it, uh, you pull off what you need and you, you hook it up to the engine. You don't need a, a person at the tailboard. We all have a pump operator that could break the, the line. That's what we do in, in our town. Um, and, uh, uh, another quote I was thinking of was, uh, uh, I'm, I'm forgetting my, my train of thought right now, but Elon Musk had one and he said, the best process is, is no process. And we have a process, but what we're really doing is minimizing the amount of processes that we have. We don't have to have a cross lay here and a, a different length cross lay loaded this way and one off the back and a a gated Y operation. And then the final one I'll say, I just recalled my, my brain is working again, was from um, Bruce Lee. He said, I, I fear not the man that's practiced 10,000 kicks. I fear the man that's practiced one kick 10,000 times. And that is what the FDNY load or a simple static load that works in a, a large variety of, of situations is. They've practiced this one stretch to 10,000 jobs. And uh, it builds in that efficiency uh, and works in a variety of, of areas. But yeah, I think overall, if somebody is out there trying to make a, a change, they have to look at changing the, the, that human nature and not, not so much the, the equipment and be inclusive with that. Well, fellas, you know what I think? I think we're looking at our keynoter for FDIC 2023 or 2024, because you are one eloquent guy. No matter you, no wonder you're my hero. Uh, that was very insightful. Uh, now, I'm going to qualify the, these videos. This is just guys trying different things. Uh, if you can show the first video, uh, again, we have our open mind. We're just trying a couple of different varieties of things here. So, if Peter, could you show the first video? All right, here we go. All right. All right, so we've got 50 feet bundled there. And then burn here, fine Irish lad, is going to grab another part of the bundle and put it on this guy's shoulder. Now, we're going to go through a multitude, and then he is going to load the rest of the load on his shoulder. Maybe, maybe a little bit remaining that the driver engineer can take care of. Okay, so intentionally, we're going through obstacles. Okay, you would never be able to do that with a triple layer, you would have to strategically put a, a firefighter at every one of those obstacles. And we're intentionally going around hose magnets, which is the vehicle tire. I don't know the other guy, but burn, fine Irish lad. I'd take a whole friggin' fire department full of those guys. He's a, he's a tiger. All right, let's try this other one here. Okay, we're gonna bundle. We bundled 50 feet. Now that's Juan Miguel, he's a training. What he's gonna do, he's gonna hand it to this guy over the fence. So we're not going through the fence gate. He's got himself 50 feet, and that's all he's going to need for this unit. 
right? And you're just going to pop the straps and pull it back. Well, he, I think he's going to go back and get more holes here. There's that damn police car again, Bill. No, that's one of ours. That's actually one of ours. Uh, actually, Ricky uh, Stevens' it's, it's car. Fire rescue now. Okay. There you go. All right. Uh, perfect. No, but uh, that's a lot of hose in a small small place. So that that's what we're working on, and and the fellas are coming up with this on their own, and. Uh, and I, I'm proud of the department for, uh, in a way, what you were talking about, Daryl, it's kind of like you're going to have to get out of your comfort zone. And also, you can't be afraid to fail. You know, you try, hey, fellas, I want to show you this load. And it fails, it fails, okay? Let's let it fail out here on the drill ground, not on the, not on the fire ground. But, um, and I like what you said about a system that's not a system or something. And that's basically what I was saying about a, a hose load has got to be foolproof. Uh, so any fool can pull it and forgiving. So it doesn't have to be that precise. Um, Bill, can I say something about failing? Man. Yes, sir. Um, when I was a fireman um, back in Spanish Harlem, we had some companies who wanted to try one length of inch and three quarter on the standpipe kit for fires in the projects to see how well it worked, to give them a little more speed and mobility, moving with the inch and three quarter at the time with our nozzles and everything else. And we went to a job and it turned out in the apartment, they were uh, making the cocaine, the free base stuff with the ether and everything. And let me tell you something, the engines got their asses kicked. They got it handed to them. And the chief said, well, that's a failed experiment. I never want to see another length of inch and three quarter on a standpipe in my battalion, period, end of story. And we tried, we failed, it didn't work. Now it, it was one of the weird ones. It was a little bit of an outlier or whatever else. But again, we can try these things. And we've tried a lot of things in the fire service with that have failed. But there's nothing wrong with trying them. It's better if we try them, like you said, at the drill ground. We try our loads. We try our nozzles and everything else. And there are some that failed. But we have to keep on trying to get better. Mike, it's, it's that ego. It's that, you know, I keep getting calls from legions of adoring females. Doctor's you know, offices? What's that? Doctor's offices? No, no nursing homes. AARP. <laughs> nursing homes. Nursing homes. Hey, Bill, can I add one thing to what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, man. Hey, are we, Peter, are we hard and faster? Or can we go a little bit, go a little bit over, Peter? Good to go. Good okay. To go. go ahead. Go ahead, Chief. Um, so one of the things we added to our rigs that was really huge for, in helping us is to the point all these guys have been talking about, right? Because um, you know, the fires don't assimilate to our manuals. Uh, the fire always gets a boat. It's going to do its thing. And we have to make sure we can get a hose line to it. So with our cross lays, one of the things we put on all our cross lays was a six foot pony sleeve that goes from that chicksaw valve yeah, yeah. to where a line connects. And that gave us the ability that, hey, if I need a 400 line, a second one or a 450 foot line, I don't have to crawl on top of the engine, try to get my hand down and my sausage link fingers and disconnect this thing from the top of the engine, which I haven't done in a year. But if I have that six foot pony sleeve and I pull it on my shoulder and I pull it out and I, and I pick that load on my shoulder, I walk out. The driver disconnects it, we're gone. And that was really huge for us because one of the requirements I have for our guys, uh, our fourth engine is always our writ. Um, and when we, we start a writ, you know, we, we essentially told people, bring the equivalent of a rescue squad and, and accumulate in the front yard. But yet I've never heard anyone ever call a mayday and say, I need three Stokes baskets and two chainsaws. You know, what they say is I need air or I need water. So if our engine is going to be our writ, you know, I want the engine to have a hose line and they have to have air. The, the, the other companies we have coming in, which is a, a, another assignment we have, will handle a lot of that other parts of it. So, you know, the engines, that gave them another option was, hey, I'm the fourth new engine. I don't have to pull a hose line off the first new engine that's parked in the front or the second is on the plug or the third in the rear. I can walk up with my shoulder load of 200 feet, go to the engine and say, hey, that, that discharge you have right there, I need that for the rig. 
and they deploy the line they're right there where they need to be and they're in a great position. So, you know, something that costs absolutely nothing of having a, a pony sleeve can give you so many options. Um, and to Daryl's point is, you know, we're looking for mastery, right? You know, you're a master of your craft. That's what I'm looking for is that, you know, autonomy breeds mastery. So the more that you have autonomy to think like a company officer and to accomplish that task, and we give you a simple tool like that and, and not to overthink the problem. So just a, a, a really small thing that was incredibly beneficial for us. Well, uh, in my classes, and I, I think you and I are the only two guys on the fire department that uh, agree to this. The most overlooked, underestimated, neglected piece of equipment for a rapid intervention company or team is a friggin' hose line. Like you say, it's either going to be air or it's going to be water. Yeah. If I've got a burning facade in the front of a store fall down on top of me and I'm on fire, that's what I'm going to need. And and I think that's neglect. Is it Jerry Tracy says, uh, are you really going to rely if you're trapped inside a building, those men with tools, he calls it, men with tools standing there like shepherds, even if the RIT team softens the building. You know, outside vent opens up alternate means of egress, puts up ladders, familiarizes themselves with the layouts. We're still overlooking what I think is an essential piece of equipment. Well, I mean, uh, look, you bring all these tools. What, tell me what's rapid about that. That's eventual intervention. <laughs> eventual intervention. I like that. I mean, what's rapid is I, I think I'm burning to death. I would like you to keep this fire off of me. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think we're, we're really speaking to the point of how important uh, e efficiency is. Uh, I have no doubt every firefighter uh, across this, this country will get a nozzle to the fire. The real question is, is the efficiency of that stretch. Uh, it, we could drive any, any rig uh, down into Manhattan and somebody's going to get whatever rig they have. They're going to get a line up there but it, it may not be pretty and it may not be efficient. It may be efficient for uh, uh, a niche area of, of their district or, or something. But what I think is uh, overlooked is that there are other loads out there that, are, that can be just as efficient and not work for the 90% of what they're looking for. But uh, I, I think that load is, is so... Uh, dialed it's it is almost mastery in, in my mind that it it works for nearly a hundred percent unless the stretch is over 800 feet long or something like that um but we may need that line for us as well as a, a victim very rapidly and uh, if we can uh, eliminate i think a lot of what i've learned over the years is this isn't about adding more equipment for variables it's about elimination of options uh, that work for a wide variety of variables. So uh, when I started my current department, we had four different pre-connects. We were carrying more inch and three quarter than the FDNY, 150 on the bumper, a 200, a 250, a 300 on the back, and then the, the two bundles of inch and three quarter for a gated Y operation over a thousand feet of inch and three quarter to have a line 50 feet longer, you had to have a whole nother 200 feet and then another 50 feet. It's, it's kind of crazy when you think about it from the cost and, and then even just putting everybody on the same page. I have definitely been to jobs where I had one firefighter going to one cross lay and the other going to a different one thinking something else was going on. That's not going to happen in Detroit or Cleveland or, or LA or FDNY because they're going to one large static bed and that adds a tremendous amount of efficiency. Uh, the other thing is um, we had talked about that triple load working very well if it's if it's one straight line. That doesn't mean the other loads aren't going to work well if it's if it's in one straight line. I mean, uh, anything can work in, in that that situation. But I have to give credit to. Uh, my other partner in crime, not just Dennis Legear, but Jay Camella, who I uh, oh, taught me a lot. Fine man. He he told me it is not efficient to drag hose; it's efficient to carry it. And he really worked on people carrying hose, so you can get it through that junkyard or staircases or over debris of the cars and things like that. 
and that is a one hundred percent true. That could, do you still have uh, contact with Jay? Oh yeah, we live uh, Darryl, really in the same please. town. Would you send? Would you what I sent you? Would you send that to Jay, please? I will. I will. Please, uh, because that's my whole philosophy. I want to carry the hose. I don't want to drag it. I want to carry it. Uh, yeah. I got to tell you, I want to thank you guys because I needed this. Uh, I needed somebody to ignite the fire in my belly. And what we've been talking about for the last hours was just absolutely spot on. And uh, it's given me some really good ammunition. Uh, we're going to wrap this up. But before we do that, we're going to thank uh, our friends at Key. That's uh, Key hose.com um just briefly daryl we talk about uh, stretching a um, not using a y anymore uh not using a trunk line well it used to be years ago the the limit you would have of of, of inch and three quarter was 300 feet those days are long gone for two reasons brother one is we're using a low pressure nozzle so you're dealing with an extra 50 pounds you can use for additional friction loss the other thing is let's just let's just use key combat ready at 185 gallons a minute. It's 25 pounds friction loss per 100 feet. You stretch four or 500 feet, and remember, it's almost always, with maybe the exception of like you're going to shut off a valve of an LP tank or something. But other than that, first line first, first line first. I think it's the FDNY, Mike that they won't hesitate to team up the first three engine companies to get that first critical line into operation. Am I correct on that? You're muted, Mike. Yeah, absolutely, Phil. Absolutely. At minimum, the first line is two engine companies. At minimum. Okay? Unless it's a single-story area of Queens or something like that, a one-and-a-half story story, a two-story private dwelling, and the adjoining building is catching on fire, then they might, but they're going to always team up two engine companies. All right. Well, fellas, I think we're going to wrap it up for today. What a great discussion. And you know what? Isn't it something we go all over the, the map? <clears throat> what do we always seem to come back to is the basics, and we all have a passion for it. Uh, Captain Mike, man, what a distinct honor uh for you to be addressing the military on 9 11 and uh uh and also for the year award for your lifetime achievement award and and uh i i am proud to call you my friend uh and to know you and uh and as i said um anybody that has ever been touched by captain mike uh in training or at work uh, has to be a better firefighter, a better fire officer, and a better person uh, because of uh, his interactions with Captain Mike. So, fellas, what a great, uh, great uh, meeting we had today. And uh, I thank you all, and you really charged me up. Uh, until next month, be safe. For God's sake, be healthy, and God bless.